tooth decay, gum disease, crooked teeth, wisdom teeth impactions. These have not occurred all through anthropological history. If you ask any anthropologist, if you read any of the studies, they'll show that no humans, no human cultures had significant dental disease until we hit the Industrial Revolution. What we're seeing in kids' mouths today is not a normal part of human history. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions and Food Farming in the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Hoda Labradagor. This is episode 128, and my guest is Dr. Stephen Lin. Stephen is a world-leading functional dentist, a TEDx speaker, and the author of the international best-selling book, The Dental Diet. He is a whole health advocate, very much in keeping with the wise traditions approach of the Weston A. Price Foundation. He even references Dr. Price's work in his book. Stephen understands that dental concerns often stem from issues with our diet. We tend to think that our dental health is related to exactly how much we brush and floss. Well, I'm not saying we should set aside those habits, but today Stephen does some important myth-busting on this topic. He helps us identify key minerals and vitamins that can improve our dental health, help our children avoid crowded teeth and braces, and up our overall well-being. Before we get into the discussion, we want to recognize our sponsors. Wise Traditions is supported in part by Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant, the probiotic everyone's talking about. Go to thriveprobiotic.com. And listeners like you, your donations and membership contributions help support projects like this podcast. Go to westonaprice.org to give a gift today. And thank you. Welcome to Wise Tradition, Stephen. Hi, Hilda. It's such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. You first came across the principles of Weston A. Price when you were backpacking across Europe. Tell us that story. Yeah, I'd taken some time away from dental practice because I was starting to feel a little bit repetitive and a little bit disillusioned with whether I could work as a dentist for the rest of my life. And I actually uh, took some time off. I went backpacking through Europe and I was actually in a traveler's hostel in Istanbul, Turkey. And I was looking at a shared reading bookshelf there. And I came across a book with a name on the spine named Weston A. Price, who I'd never heard of before. I was trained in biomedical science and as clinically as a dentist. And so seven years of tertiary education, I'd never heard of the book. And so I picked it up and it really was an eye opener for me. I would look through the pages, you know, this story of this dentist from the 30s. And I really kind of looked at it and kind of discounted it. My training led me to be skeptical of it. And I put it in my bag and I kind of forgot about it for a few years. But then it kind of kept speaking to me. And so there was something about price. I felt that there was something lost in his words. And so I went back to the book a few years later. And I realized I didn't understand it. And that was really the start of my journey to writing The Dental Diet. And I really wanted to find out why my training hadn't explained what Price was talking about. And then I felt that there was a story there. And so that was starting to look into human anthropology, calcium metabolism in the body, fat soluble nutrients, the human microbiome, and all of these things that now plug in scientifically what Price is talking about. And that's really what I've tried to put together in The Dental Diet and how it all started, really. Well, it's just a shame, I think, that this information isn't provided and isn't part of the curriculum of those studying to become dentists because it seems so basic. Instead of just addressing the cavities or the gum disease, why don't we get to the root of what the problem is, which is what Dr. Price's research did, correct? That's exactly right. And so training today has this big problem is that we look at diseases that we react to and we don't understand how they occur, tooth decay, gum disease, Crooked teeth or malocclusion, why kids need braces today, wisdom teeth impactions, they are all problems with feeding ourselves the wrong things that begin you know, right before conception. This is all what Price was talking about. And really what we have now is that science has validated Price's observations and we need to go forward and plug those gaps in because we have a big problem with dental diseases in society and actually we've got an even bigger problem how they connect to chronic diseases that is costing us billions. And we're a very sick population. We need to understand how the mouth is how we design how to eat for a healthy body and healthy life. I am so thrilled that your book and your speaking is pointing to Dr. Price's 
valuable information and really helping to fill in the gaps, as you said. And so I want to do that today, Stephen. I want us to go through kind of some myth busting because I think people just think, oh, I've got a little cavity or my child isn't flossing enough, so I have to take him to get a little cleaning. And they're not really digging deep on this issue that can really be life-changing for their dental health and their overall health. Let's start with myth number one. I found this on your website, so I just want to kind of go through these myths. Orthodontic braces are a necessary tool to ensure children grow up with properly aligned teeth. What is true about that myth? What do people hold on to about that? And how can we bust it? So orthodontic braces and malocclusion in kids, so why teeth don't fit into our child's jaw today, is I think one of the biggest health epidemics on the planet. And modern dental care has not addressed why it occurs. So a child that needs braces at 10 to 12 is the same issue that a young adolescent needs their wisdom teeth extracted in their early adolescence. So what we're finding here is that jaws aren't growing and we haven't addressed that. So a kid that needs braces or has crooked teeth or the signs of crooked teeth, now we can pick this up earlier, which is really important. We need to get onto this earlier. We need to get them eating the right way. We need to get them breathing the right way and using their mouth the right way so that they grow properly. You're right. We see it in the U.S. especially as a rite of passage. Oh, my 12-year-old needs braces. Well, I had braces too. And, you know, as they say in Spanish, san se acabo, and that's the end of the story. But you're saying there's actually a way to prevent this. Absolutely. At the base of it, crooked teeth hasn't occurred anywhere in our anthropological history. It's only occurred in the last generation since the Industrial Revolution, and it happens in one generation as soon as we eat them on diet. And this is really what Christ showed. He showed this all over the world. But anthropologists have confirmed the same thing in cultures all over the globe, that once we eat them on diet, jaws stop growing. Now, physiologically, we can explain that by how the body distributes calcium, fat-soluble vitamins, bone growth, but also the functional aspects of the mouth breathing, for instance, is crucial in expanding a young child's craniofacial structure and jaw. So they need to breathe through their nose, and that helps to expand their maxilla, which is the upper jaw, which gives them lots of space for those teeth. And so breaking that down and understanding that a child's craniofacial structure, their smile, so a nice straight smile means they've got a nice wide airway. And that's the most important thing any parent should be thinking about in terms of the health of their child, whether they can breathe right. And we're seeing the signs of this all the time in the dental surgery. Kids aren't breathing right, and it's because we're not growing. I think people also go to braces for their children because cosmetically they want them to look good. But there's more to it than that, isn't there? That's absolutely right. So braces basically align the teeth, and the teeth are just a symptom of the growth problem. And so if we see it like that in this very kind of superficial way, now kids can have braces into their adolescence to correct their teeth. But we need to get their jaws, their airways, and their functional aspects, especially making sure they're eating right, making sure that's all set first. So braces can be a a way to cosmetically reset the teeth in adolescence and early adulthood, but we need to see it as a whole part of a functional dental model where we understand all the different pathology that can link to poor breathing, which include kids that snore, that grind their teeth, which all link to a breathing problem. And so we need to make sure that we're addressing all these and assigning it as a growth and development issue. Absolutely. And in the foundation, we emphasize the diet as well, eating the traditional foods that are going to nourish and build up our bodies and allow for that growth of the jaw. Let's go on to myth number two, Stephen. Brushing and flossing are the best preventative methods for dental health. Tell us about that myth. Yeah, something I like to kind of tell my patients is that if you've got a problem with your car engine, do you take it to the car wash? No, you don't. You don't go to the car wash because you'll have a nice shiny paint job at the end, but you're not going to have a car that runs, do you? You've got to get under the hood and look at the engine, right? Right. And so that's really you know, our recommendations for great teeth, flossing, brushing, mouthwashes. That's all a very superficial way to look at how oral health, but the immune system inside your teeth, the oral microbiome, these are the real ways to prevent decay, to get a kid's jaw to grow, and to ultimately have them prevent dental disease throughout their whole life. But now this isn't an excuse for stopping brushing and flossing. I can just hear some kids now saying, yay, we don't have to worry about it anymore. We're just going to bed with our grimy teeth. Exactly right. So oral hygiene has its role. So, you know, every kid should be brushing their teeth and we should as well. But let's put it in the perspective of, you know, what it does. Food is the foundation of healthy teeth. And so if parents and kids are understanding better how food nutrition shapes their risk of dental disease, we have to remember too that, toothbrushes and floss, you know, really haven't been around for any more than, you know, 50 years. So 
it's a great tool we have today, but let's put it in that context and that food is the real way to prevent uh, dental diseases. Yes, you know, because I know you've studied Dr. Price's work. When he was in Switzerland, he came across some children who almost had like this slime covering their teeth. And he was like, oh, my gosh, like wondering, is this going to show a lot of incidents of cavities or whatnot? No, even though the children were not brushing, their diet was so nutrient dense that they didn't have a high incidence of cavities or any dental deformities. He was fascinated by that. And it's proof of what you're saying. Absolutely. And he saw this in every culture. There were no toothbrushes, dental surgeries, that none of that. And that's across all anthropological history. People didn't brush their teeth and they had brilliant, white, straight, white dental arches. And this is really where Price's work sets the scene, is that anthropologically dental diseases and all the other chronic diseases we see today aren't normal. The, the idea that we need to brush and scrub our teeth really is very superficial and we just should see it that way. So, Stephen, let's talk about myth number three, that crooked teeth are genetic. And so some people say the only treatment is corrective braces. This has been very much the standard dialogue of the orthodontic industry is that kids have crooked teeth because of their genes. And this is what I was told and what I was looking at in dental practice for a long time. But the science really hasn't backed that up. Now, we know certain racial backgrounds and cultures have certain propensities for different types of malocclusion, but crooked teeth in general only happens when we eat the modern diet anthropologically. So there's not a gene that predisposes you to crooked teeth. It will predispose you to a type of crooked teeth. So genes will tell us what type of malocclusion you get. They won't tell us why it happens. Food is the cause of malocclusion. And that's what Price's work you know, really showed absolutely without question that once you eat the modern diet, this is when it pops in. You, you, know, you, you look through the anthropological records, you look through the people that were eating traditional diets, right up until when he saw them. And then the people that ate the Monda and crooked teeth pops up, that's not a genetic problem. It's an environmental issue and it's a dietary issue. You know what else you can find in his book? He shows some families where the first child, let's say, was born to the parents when they were eating their traditional diet and there is plenty of room in their jaw for all their teeth. They have the proper structure, as you've been discussing, and then they'll have a subsequent child once their diet has changed and their teeth are crooked and crowded. So it goes to show it's not the genetics. They're coming from the same parents, but something changed. Absolutely. And you talk to your grandparents, you're going to find very few of your grandparents that had braces or needed them. Charles Darwin actually noted that wisdom teeth impactions were a very recent phenomena. One of his oral surgeons said, you know, once we kind of get into civilization, the back part of the jaw stops growing and then wisdom teeth don't fit. And there's no oral surgeons out in nature. There's no animal or biological systems that have crooked teeth, orthodontists or oral surgeons. It all happens once we eat them on diet. There's no arguing that. So we've been very kind of blinded. And I think we've got a little bit of amnesia in terms of how our teeth have been, you know, for the vast majority of our ancestors' history on earth and how we need to get back to that because the consequences are dire. Coming up, Dr. Lin talks about the importance of vitamins and minerals from our food and where to get them exactly. We want to pause now and recognize our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to us in part by Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant. Most probiotic pills just pass through our bodies without achieving the desired effect. Microbiologist Kiran Krishnan recommends a spore-based probiotic like Just Thrive Probiotic. Just Thrive is the first 100% spore-forming probiotic that arrives alive in the intestines naturally. It supports optimal gut health, digestive health, immune health, and delivers antioxidants. It's great for adults, kids, the whole family. The probiotic everyone's talking about. Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant. Visit their website at thriveprobiotic.com. And listeners like you, Boogie Bren had this to say on Apple Podcasts, life-changing information. Having implemented the teachings from the Weston A. Price Foundation on what real food is and the science behind it, both my and my wife's health issues are improving. After languishing for well over a decade and spending tens of thousands of dollars on doctors who just wanted to medicate, all this time the solution was right under our noses with eating real food. Boogie Bren, thank you. We are so glad that our information has been helpful to you. This is what we are all about. 
So support this mission by going to westonaprice.org and giving a gift of any size. And everybody, help spread the word about food being our medicine by rating and reviewing the show on iTunes or sharing episodes with your friends and family. And thanks so much for listening and for all of your support. Let's take a break from our myths. We'll come back to them. But I also want to talk to you about the importance of vitamins and nutrients in the food that we eat. I think in your book, you mentioned one chapter is called The Mystery of the Missing Vitamin. Which missing vitamin would that be, Stephen? Yeah, so this was one of the journeys that I took reading Price's work. You know, he wrote about Activated X in Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. And the story of Activated X is just fascinating. And this goes to Sally Fallon and Chris Masterjohn, who I spoke to while reading the book. And I really had to understand it as well. But Price died, we have to remember, in 1948, 10 years after publishing his work, and he never identified what Activator X was. Now, it took 70 years, even after the work was republished in large scale in the, in 99, mm-hmm. before we knew that Activator X was, in fact, vitamin K2. Now, I wasn't taught about vitamin K2 in dental or medical training, and nor do doctors get that training currently. But we know that the Japanese health ministry, for example, has approved it as an osteoporosis medication. So vitamin K2 has a very different set of purposes in the body than what we're trained to see vitamin K or vitamin K1 as. And so there's a different set of molecules there. And so what it does is it works alongside A and D, just as Price talked about, to activate calcium metabolism in the body, to activate the proteins that put calcium into teeth and bone, activate the immune system inside teeth. If teeth have enough vitamin A, D, and K2, they're immune to tooth decay. And we know the cells will do this. It's all part of the osteoimmune system and how the skeletal system is created. And it's all built on signals of vitamins, fat-soluble nutrients, and K2 is a crucial director of this that we've missed completely. And so when people start to embrace foods that give them these essential nutrients, especially vitamins D, A, and K2, then they can see some dental improvements and even prevent some of these things we've been talking about. Absolutely. K2, we are now beginning to understand, and there's a lot of research on K2, but we have a lot more to uncover as well, does vast things throughout the body. And I really see this in patients, and I tell them that this is probably the first sign that you're not getting enough K2s. You know that spot behind your front teeth that your dentist cleans that gets that calculus buildup? Mm-hmm. Now, that plaque buildup, you shouldn't really get that kind of thick calcified builder that's called dental calculus and that's a sign your body isn't distributing calcium and so that's a sign you're not getting enough k2 now once my patients have vitamin k2 they don't get that thick buildup anymore and so dental calculus is a sign that your body isn't distributing calcium enough and the same thing is happening in your arteries and your kidneys uh, in your prostate in all other soft tissues your body can't manage yeah. calcium the way we need it to so dental calculus gum health tooth health is all linked to vitamin K2. And what are some sources of vitamin K2? Like how do you include these things in your own diet? I mean, I love butter from grass-raised cows and reintroducing butter to my own diet has been one of the most rewarding parts of finding Price's work because I really thought yeah, that we had to strip it out of our diet you know, as we were taught through low-fat principles of healthy eating. Egg yolks, organ meats, these are the things that are rich in K2 cheeses. And we have to remember, too, that there's two sources of vitamin K2, and they're sourced from different types of foods. The animal source, which is the menaquinone 4, MK4 type of K2. Now, that comes from your butter, your egg yolks, your organ meats. And so that type is very active in the body, and it's absorbed very quickly across our organs, and we use it very quickly. The menaquinone 7 type of vitamin K2 actually is sourced from bacterial sources, so fermented foods like sauerkraut and Japanese nata. And this has different roles in the body, but it also is converted into menaquinone 4 in the liver. So getting some of that menaquinone 4 from your diet is crucial, but also getting some from fermented foods as well is generally how people have eaten vitamin K2 for thousands and thousands of years. So getting a bit of both, I tell patients to make sure they're getting that balance right. Absolutely. You're preaching to the choir here because we at Wise Traditions are so fond of all these foods that are not only nutrient dense and rich in these vitamins, but delicious. So we're glad that you're enjoying butter and all these good things as well, Stephen. It really heartens me to hear that. I wanted to ask you one quick question before we get back to the myths. Emu oil, I've heard, is a good source of vitamin K2. Is that correct? 
Yeah, emu oil is used by indigenous Australians for thousands and thousands of years. So what they would do is they would get the very rich and the very thick back fat from emus. They found that it was very nutrient dense and nutrient dense in vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 is a difficult nutrient to source in the environment. So cultures were very, very careful to make sure that they knew where it was coming from and to treasure those foods. Emu oil is one of those foods in Australia because the Australian outback is a difficult place to live. So they need those sources and they made sure they did and their teeth were wonderful as a result. So Stephen, let's pivot and go back to the myths now. Myth number five is that dental disease is a normal part of life and has been normal for all of human history. What do you say to that? How do you bust that myth? Dental disease in terms of everything we see today is not normal. Tooth decay, gum disease, crooked teeth, wisdom teeth impactions. These have not occurred all through anthropological history. If you ask any anthropologist, if you read any of the studies, they'll show that no humans, no human cultures had significant dental disease until we hit the Industrial Revolution. The Agricultural Revolution, we started to see some tooth decay. But in terms of what I see today in the dental practice and what we see across the globe now, it just doesn't happen. So it's really important that we frame it this way. What we're seeing in kids' mouths today is not a normal part of human history. And as you said, the anthropological record shows this. Dr. Price, for example, when he was in Peru, he found all of these skulls on the shoreline because people had been raiding the tombs. And over a thousand skulls, Stephen, showed no dental deformities whatsoever. In other words, the jaws were sufficiently developed. The teeth were in their places. They were nice and straight. There were no crooked teeth or crowded teeth. So these records are what point to the fact that something has changed in modern society. Absolutely. And this is why there's so much beauty in Price's work is that he took such a broad perspective of human health. And I think why it's one of the most important health books ever written in that we can see the history of our species in our teeth and jaws. That's what we find it in. That's what archaeologists dig up. And so once we build this perspective, it's very difficult to start to just treat diseases and start to think that that's normal and start to put braces on kids and that our modern view on the mouth and what we see in terms of modern dental rates in society is completely anthropologically incorrect. I'm so glad you're getting the word out about that. I'm so glad you're a part of circles where they're spreading the news because it's just too easy to put the braces on the kid, extract those impacted wisdom teeth and so on without forethought or, you know, thinking, okay, I'm helping this child, but there's so much more that we can be doing, right? Exactly. And that really was the learning process I needed to take once I found Price's work is that my modern training did not give that perspective. And that we need to see that once you plug that in, there is an entire model of healthcare that we need to replace. And so treatment, you know, braces, wisdom teeth extractions, filling, that's all fine. You know, that's there for us to use. But we need to move now into understanding the body and how physiologically the mouth body connection, the oral systemic link really is the model for how we build dietary guidelines, how we tell parents to help their kids grow and develop. All of this, I think, is an exciting future of dental medicine. I agree 100%. Now let's go to myth number six. Bleeding gums are purely a dental condition. Do some people believe that? Yeah. Unfortunately, we see bleeding gums as a very localized problem and that people who go to the dentist with bleeding gums will be told that they need to floss more and brush more. Now, bleeding gums aren't just a sign that you're flossing or brushing right. Bleeding gums are a sign that your immune system, your gut, your microbiome are out of balance because in your mouth you have an interface between your immune system and the microbes, the oral microbiome lives there, and the immune system, 80% of it, begins in your gut. So if you have bleeding gums, you should be immediately thinking about your gut health. And that then links us to all of the problems we begin to see with chronic health problems like digestive issues, type 2 diabetes, brain issues, behavior, all of this is now linked to the gut and we can build this out and all the signs start in the mouth. So how would you start to address gut issues? We've had several folks on our podcast before and who've written articles for our journal about this, but what do you recommend, Stephen? The underlying factors that I see in the dental surgery is that we start to heal from the mouth in. And so vitamin D levels are crucial. They're crucial for the gut, the microbiome. So we need to fix that diet. We need to get that nutrient-dense diet in. We need to get their breathing right because sleep apnea and breathing problems, we now know, shifts the gut microbiota. And so sleep disorders, for instance, if we are trying to heal the gut without 
healing their breathing and sleep. We're working at the problem backwards and we're really fighting an uphill battle. And then the other issue is we need to start feeding the microbes the right thing. So we can use probiotics and other healing issues. We might need to check food intolerances, for instance, to see if there's any irritations through the diet. And sometimes people need to remove certain foods for three months and then we can start to heal. And that's a real way so that we build it from a foundational manner instead of just trying to heal at the end stage. Thank you for reminding us that breathing and sleep are critical pieces to our health. Get ahead of the curve and don't just react, but be proactive. I've heard you say something about the grandmother effect. What is the grandmother effect, Stephen? The grandmother effect tells us how the life of your grandmother today has an impact on your health and how your body expresses itself. And this is all part of the scientific model of epigenetics. And we talk about it in the Dental Diets Chapter 6. We wrap up how every meal, every breath they take, their stress levels will impact their grandchildren. And that's how your life will impact your grandchildren too, because we now know that genetic models aren't static and we actually take information from the environment and we pass it on to our children. So that's why this model of health is really important because we are passing this to our next generations. That's true. Every choice we make impacts not only our own health, but the health of our children and future generations. That's basically what you're saying. Absolutely. And we now have the scientific rationale and we need to build the healthcare model out to completely help parents to raise kids that don't have these problems. Well, you have so much fascinating information. We are going to link in our show notes to your book and to your website so people can find out more. We didn't even touch on like, is plaque protective actually? And, you know, some of the other things that you hit on in your book. So we'll definitely put the links in the show notes. And I want to wrap things up, Stephen, by asking you if the listener could do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? I would recommend that you start a breathing exercise. So in the dental diet, we learn to breathe before we eat. And so one time a day, try a nasal diaphragmatic breathing exercise where you take a deep breath through the nose into your belly and you take a minute to cycle through where you exhale slower. And what that does is it calms down your neurological system to get your digestion ready to fire up and eat. And it will actually help you balance your breathing patterns that will hopefully help you sleep better, eat better and feel better. Fascinating. Well, I hope our listeners give that a try. I know I will. And we've really appreciated this conversation today, Stephen. Thank you so much for your time. Hilda, I appreciate it so much. It's such a pleasure. My guest today was Dr. Stephen Lin. To connect with Stephen, go to drstephenlin.com. That's Stephen with a V, by the way. And for the show notes and highlights from this episode, with links to resources we mentioned and links to Stephen's book, just go to our website, westonaprice.org, and find the show notes for episode 128. Hey, and stay connected with us. We've got all kinds of resources and stuff going on. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Weston A. Price, and look for us on Facebook, Weston A. Price Foundation. Next week, we have a fascinating and important topic coming up as we discuss how we are a generation zapped by electromagnetic frequencies. My guest is Dr. George Carlo, a renowned tech expert and scientist. He describes to us exactly what kind of exposure we're facing from our cell phones, tablets, Wi-Fi, and the like, and its effect on our bodies, and what we can do to protect ourselves. George was one of the experts featured in that new documentary, Generation Zapped. He knows his stuff. You're going to want to hear this. I was personally riveted. Last but not least, thank you to Podcast Village, to Rob Ford, and the team of interns who help with the show. Cynthia Castro Cohen Enriquez, Joy de los Santos, Amy Marvin, Lily Hempt, Mary Hine, Deirdre Beard, and Olga de Villiers. Hey, everybody, and don't forget that I am here for you. I'm on Twitter at Holistic Hilda. I'm also on Instagram at Holistic underscore Hilda. I also have a blog and services that I offer to support your wellness and podcasting journeys. So go to HolisticHilda.com for all of the above. Thanks, everybody, and keep on listening. Did you know that there are Weston A. Price Foundation chapters all over the U.S. and around the world? Chapter leaders help you find good food in your area, and some have meetings you can attend. Go to our website, westonaprice.org, and click on Find a Local Chapter to see if there is one near you. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food Farming in the Healing Arts. The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice.